Well, the one thing y'all did deliver Daytona, and Dad's been looking for a Daytona 500 win for his <laughs> whole career, right? <laughs> and I think for the most part, we all, uh, I say we, the family, um, uncles and, and brothers and sisters and Mamma and everybody was just thinking, well, maybe it ain't to be. You know, the, you can't have everything. Uh, you can, you know, you can be, you know, he had won almost everything, but maybe that's just something that just he ain't going to get. Mm. Uh, but y'all got it. Y'all had it. Y'all made it happen. So uh, one of the things I wanted you to do and ask you if you could when you came is to, to help us sort of go through that process. Y'all had a year together uh, that you were uh, not competitive as you wanted to be, frustrated. Uh, so where is the – you have a whole off season to – every off season, if you don't have a good year, you, you go into that off season and you spend all those months physically and mentally sort of turning your uh, attitude around, right? Getting your hopes back up and talking to that driver and, and, and talking to that crew chief and getting all the reasons why this year is going to be better. Um, so so kind of run us through that. I mean, what was the interaction like leading into 1998 between you and Dad? Uh, where was uh, his attitude? Where was your attitude? How was y'all's communication? Yeah, I mean, we, we, we talked quite a bit during the off season, um, And, you know, he, he – even though I think we were, we were down, I don't think either one of us had really lost our confidence. I don't think we'd lost our confidence in each other. Uh, you know, so, so much was said and so much was written about your dad and I not getting along, and, and that really was untrue. Really? Uh, yeah, we had some spirited conversations. Don't get me wrong, but but I looked at your dad as my friend, and you know, even after Richard split us up, you know, your dad and I still had many conversations. You know, it just I think our personalities were so different. You talked about the relationship that that him and Kurt had, and him and Andy had. They they were similar. They were kind of laid back. They kind of just took, went with the flow of things, you know. And old Larry Mack is the high-strung guy <laughs> that's on the 9,000 chip nonstop. And it, it's, it's like Richard told me when he, when he made the decision to, to, to swap crew chiefs, which I'm very thankful, you know, he didn't just come in and fire me, which he probably had every right to. Uh, he said – Best thing I can tell you, Larry, you intimidated the damn intimidator. That's all I can tell you. But mm-hmm. but over the off season, we we still had some energy. We still were optimistic, and I think a lot what was giving us a lot of optimism. Maybe we were hanging our hat on one thing too many. Was this car that was built to go to speed weeks in 1998? We built that car during the summer of 1997. That car had been in the wind tunnel and had been to Talladega and tested with Marcus and Mike Dillon, probably been to the wind tunnel three or four times and been tested at Talladega two or three times before your dad ever even laid eyes on it. I mean, I remember leaving Michigan in August of 97 and going straight to Detroit. We had that car in the wind tunnel. And... We wind tunnels are, were only in Detroit. Detroit, Detroit I mean, or, they didn't have them down here. No, <laughs> d- 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 Detroit or Atlanta. Yeah. It's the, that was wow. your only choice. We almost cut the body off that car after the first trip to the wind tunnel, which I'm very glad we didn't because it it was it was mysterious. It it the drag on the car was not that good, but when you yawed the car in the wind tunnel, the drag didn't go up. And that backed up exactly what Marcus told us the first time he tested it. He said he's going to love this car. He said when you go off in the corner and turn, and the data backed it up, and you turn the steering wheel, the damn thing don't lose RPM. We don't know why. We couldn't, we couldn't duplicate cars. You know, back then we put quarter panels and fenders on by, that's good right there. <laughs> yeah. that's, that, nail it. As long as it fits the template, nail it. And uh, when we went to Daytona and tested that thing in January – I can still see that Chester Cat grin the first time he drove it. He said, this thing's good. How come y'all didn't try to race that car in the end of 97? We only had one other race left, and, of course, that was Talladega. 
And because that was still back when we, we ran, you know, the, the 4th of July race mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. summertime. Uh, so we only had the one more race. And the car that we had run at Talladega in the spring, we ran second to Mark Martin. And if, if, if he'd have worked with me a little more, I think when we got to Talladega in the fall, we maybe could have won that race because the race we ran second to Mark at Talladega in the spring, it was a caution-free race. And we had figured out the six had those real aggressive pull-down shocks on. Well, I unloaded at Talladega in the fall with those pull-down shocks on, I don't even know if he got the high gear going down the back stretch. <laughs> Came in, get them damn things off. Yeah. I said, Dale, that's what beat us in the spring. I don't I don't care. I can't drive that. Wow. So I remember <laughs> running those. They were on our Xfinity cars in ninety eight, maybe ninety nine before they ever got rid of them. Uh but Mike, they would tie down the car. Literally the the shock, the rear shock had just as much rebound as you could get in it. So when the car got out on the racetrack, the shocks would uh, compress and they would it would hold uh, the shock would hold the car down and when the car when the rear tires would leave the ground uh, the shocks wouldn't come out so the car would bounce yeah the back would a, that's bounce a huge difference a, a bucking horse it was <laughs> I bet it was painful in your lower back kidneys in your guts uh, bouncing in the seat like that and it, every uh, corner exit was the worst as far as I remember, but it was every lap and we qualified and raced them. And you just, that was just what you had to do. Like that's the, that's the, going back to what I was talking about. 45 year old goes out there, makes half a lap, comes in and says, <laughs> take them off. I ain't driving it. 25 year old goes out there and goes, I can do this. <laughs> if this is what you say I need to do, I got it. And say, are you sure this is faster? Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's faster. I guarantee it's faster. <laughs> I'm wondering how those are faster. It sounds like it would slow you down being as, nah, uh, well, as the, bumpy it, as a Well, ride. the rear spoiler is like yeah. an inch lower or something like, you know. Oh, all the way around the race. You're getting that old so spoiler out of the air. Yeah. So fast. Yeah. So wow. interesting. So, all right, talk, go back to the car for back to the, the car you built for Daytona. Um, you got a good. You know, attitudes are still reasonable going into this, going into the uh, the season. He goes and tests the car, or, or is it? Uh, did y'all have January tests? He drives the car. We to did, test? yeah. He that's the first time he ever even saw the car He's was, uh, and he he was tickled to death. So, what was testing like with him when he was actually in the car? You know, <laughs> I, I think at, at Daytona, you know, but because he loved that place yeah. it, it wasn't bad you know and it, it was kind of a laid-back atmosphere you you know yeah you're trying you know we that's still had our box of cardboard box full of cow configurations that we'd go through this you know all these different matrices of cows and stuff and you know he's kind of laid back i think he always kind of enjoyed going to daytona and testing yeah mm. i think so too i really loved those or you know that january test at daytona because everybody was Everything was new. All, everybody's got their new cars. He wasn't real high on sitting in line out there waiting on. Nobody his was. That was so miserable. I started. I started taking my MP3 player. And yeah, is I is uh, what they iPod iPods and all that yeah. stuff. Sit out there and I'd be listening to some music. Yeah, um, <laughs> that's the only way to get through that. Um, but y'all were y'all were optimistic. I mean, yeah, we like, were. He he was happy with the car. Did you think you had him? You think this is going to be his best shot? You know, probably no more than I did 97. I, yeah. I mean, my first time there, you know, I, I remember we'd had a very up and down day on pit road. And uh, I look up with 20 laps to go, we're leading the darn thing. And the uh, car wasn't handling quite like it should. That's when you talked a lot about handling at Daytona. What do you mean? Car just would pick that push up coming up off the corner, especially on into a run when the mm -hmm. fuel load would burn off, tires would lose grip. Thing would especially off a of turn two, it just wanted to pick that push up. But we're sitting there leading the thing with 20 laps to go, and uh, fighting with Elliot and and Gordon and that bunch, Dale Jarrett, Ernie Irvin, mm -hmm. and uh, I looked at Richard. I remember with about 17 or 18 to go, and I said, "What do you think?" He said, "Been here way too many times mm -hmm. before." With about 11 to go, when that damn thing was barrel rolling down the back straightaway, <laughs> I totally understood what he was talking about. Yeah. So. Uh, you know, I, I thought we were in a position to win that thing our first time to the racetrack together in 97. 
So that was the time where he rolled the car, got out, got in the ambulance, got back out of the ambulance, cranked it up, oh. drove it around. When that happened, now people love to, you know, talk about his fans love to talk about that. Um, <laughs> was that a bit? Was what do you think about that? I, I was lost for words because <laughs> I'm I'm watching. You know, we, we we all we had was a CBS broadcast on a TV in our pit box. Yeah. I watched the man get out of the car. I had talked to him on the radio. I watched to get it, get in the ambulance. And so I'm walking down pit road to make that turn in the garage area there by the old Goodyear yep. building down near the entrance of pit road. And you know how you'll something will catch your eye and you'll go, no, uh-uh. So I saw this black car go by, and I went, can't be. I, I saw him get out of the car. <laughs> And then I looked down pit road. He was sitting in the pits, and there went a damn soul around him because everybody <laughs> went to the garage area. <laughs> so, but that was just he. You know, he he said I I looked out that window, and he said I looked, and he said all the tires were up on that thing, and he said that's when I got back out of that ambulance, and that and that poor guy was inside. He said hit that switch, fire that thing up. He said that thing cranked up. Get the hell out of my race car. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, but the man. thing I love about that, Dale, something I've always prided myself in, regardless if we were winning races or struggling to run in the top 20, hated DNFs. Mm -hmm. Even though 97 was an atrocious year for finding victory lane, by finishing that race right there and, and not listed as a DNF, we went the entire season and had zero DNFs. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh. That's something I was very proud is of. Is that right? Yeah. That is uh, something that I think uh, – me and Tony Senior, Tony Junior, we all sort of had that attitude too about um, no matter what, you need to try to get back out there and finish. And I mean, there there's races where you would love to just load the thing up and go home, but you know, as soon as you do, and and you see those results, and you know that you could have got back out there and finished. There's a weird. It, it's hard to explain to somebody I think that's never went to a race and competed, but there is a massive amount of de depression and guilt that you carry with you if you don't finish a race you could have finished yeah so you crash right you miss some parts and fenders and, and the car's junk you're going to go out there and ride around in the way a second off the pace or whatever for the rest of the day nobody wants to do that but if you don't do that right you, knowing you could have it's such an awful feeling uh, dirty awful feeling yeah a, a, that car really shouldn't have finished that race. Yeah. I mean, that that there was more stuff missing off that car, and we were taping and bell wire yeah. with bell wire and anything we could do to. And I'm thinking they ain't never gonna let this thing go back out there. And then on my NASCAR scanner, I said I heard the words three car clear to go." Oh, <laughs> <boy. laughs> hey, That's you know, <laughs> I'm curious. Um, even on the years where he wasn't winning the Daytona 500, it seemed like he was winning everything else during oh. speed weeks, right? And I was curious, did he enjoy the shootout or the clash? Did he enjoy the duels? Did he enjoy all I think that things? man enjoyed practicing at Daytona. Really? Yeah. I mean, he just loved to go out there. And, and I remember with this particular car, you know, we practiced every day, three times a day. <laughs> and I remember somewhere between – Sunday of qualifying and in in the dual race, you know, your dad was notorious for leaving that garage area and going out there and being the first in line and then leading a, a group of cars around there for 20 laps. And this one practice, he just led the pack, led the pack, and led the pack. And finally, I said, Dale, why don't you get back in the pack and let's see what that thing would do at the pack? He's, you know what his response was? Don't plan on being there. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'd heard that. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, that's the most badass response I think I've ever heard. I mean, how was I going to argue with that? Don't, yeah. don't, don't, don't <laughs> argue with him. <laughs> now, was that in 98? That was 98. Oh, this, was about, uh, this was practice on maybe Tuesday or Wednesday. That car, it's almost like the slicker that track got, the better that car got. It just, it just it didn't deteriorate. It oh. didn't go away. It just kept getting better. Boy, I have to think that even after all those years of coming close, I'd have to look around and going, this might actually be our year there. I mean, like, he don't plan on being in the back. Well, you ding, you know, you've been I know. 20 years. and I know, but that is some, that's a level of confidence right there. He, he liked the he car. He definitely had, he had some bounce in his step the entire speed weeks from the time we unloaded, no question. Interesting. All right, hold up. I got one more question, though, about this, leading into the race. That was also the year you – 
crashed in Daytona. Yeah. And so you were like, how how plugged in were you with all this stuff going on at the at the time leading into the race? Or none, none. Yeah. Okay. Like I I'm uh, like up the, my eyeballs <laughs> in. Uh, with racing that Xfinity car, I mean, I'd never race, you know, anything like this. You didn't know you getting that ride until yeah. like a month I was, earlier. <laughs> I, that Cup Garage didn't even exist. <laughs> I had no clue that I had no clue the Daytona 500 was even happening. <laughs> I don't even remember the duels or any of that. <laughs> but uh, right. it was I was overwhelmed. Yeah, and uh, we flipped, and um, I had I hit my head and got a concussion, and so I was on the couch at home. Well, I knew that. Yeah. I just didn't know if you Watching were watching the five hundred. I was so mad because I wasn't. I was feeling like I was feeling sick, but I wasn't sick enough that I couldn't have been there. If I'd known he's going to win, I'd have probably stayed. But, sure, because I'd love to have been in that victory lane. Um, well, all right. Uh, anything unusual about race morning? Not really. Well, it all kind of started started to unravel. I thought it was unraveling on us on on Friday. <clears throat> Your dad. Started feeling a little under the weather about Wednesday. He was almost like he had a stomach bug, bug mm. or something. And I knew even the, the day of the dual race, he, he, didn't, he didn't feel good. We, we won the dual race pretty handedly. And uh, I, I saw him in victory lane. He just didn't look good. So, was he telling you? I, he had said something about he didn't feel good. His stomach was bothering him, what have you. So after kind of victory lane and pictures or whatever, I don't even remember if it was the first duel or the second duel. So I looked at him. I said, you don't feel very good. He said, Larry, I feel horrible. I said, okay, here, here, let's do this. What do you think about this? I said, you're happy with this car? He said, car's good. I said, there's two practices tomorrow, Friday. I said, let's skip the morning practice. You sleep in, maybe, maybe go, maybe go infield care center, go see a doctor, whatever. If you'll come out here tomorrow afternoon, we'll go ahead and get our 500 race engine in. And if you'll just run a few laps tomorrow afternoon, let's just make sure nothing leaks, everything's good, and then we'll get serious in happy hour on Saturday. Back then, of course, happy hour still after the Xfinity Series race. He said, man, that sounds like the best plan I've heard in a while. So sure enough, we change that engine, take our time Friday morning, you know, Crew chief still nervous because it's like, damn, they're out there practicing. And we're sitting in here changing engines. You yeah. know, it's just typical personality of a crew chief. So we got that engine changed. So this plan's right on track until about 10 minutes before that Friday afternoon practice. One of those old afternoon thunderstorms rolled in there oh boy. and washed it out. Okay, we're still good. You know, we, we still got a full hour tomorrow, and he's still happy with his car. You know, we'll just – we'll we'll dot some I's and cross some T's tomorrow, and we'll be ready to run happy hour. So we're ready, and classic, your dad, man, he's in that car. He's buckled in. He's ready to drive out the garage gate. I don't even think he got to third gear going off pit road down to turn one. Something's wrong with this engine. So he came in. Danny Lawrence and them raised the hood. They looked at spark plug wires, making sure they were all on. They pulled the spark plug wires, uh, plugs out, put new ones in, looked a few things, sent it back out. He didn't even get the high gear down the back stretch. Damn it, I'm telling y'all something's wrong with this engine. So he comes back in. They pull the valve covers off. And I'm looking now. We've already missed 20 minutes of this practice. We've not turned a lap since the checkered flag on Thursday. So I'm definitely getting starting to get a little uptight and nervous. So they pulled the valve covers off. And sure enough, on one cylinder, there was a rock arm that was broke and a push rod that was bent. Dang. Push rod was still there, but it was bent. So Danny very meticulously pulled that rock arm off. All the pieces were there. Pulled that push rod out, put new ones on, ran the valves on both sides, put it back together, cranked it up, ran fine. He left pit road. We, we're down to 20 minutes to go in his practice. But he, he made a 20-lap run. He said, man, it's good. It's golden. I was like, okay. We still – I'm a big why person. We've got to make a decision collectively. Richard, Danny, got to get Spinny Clendenin on the phone, the engine builder. <laughs> I want your dad involved. we got to go to the lounge, get on the phone. Why did that happen to that engine? Do we need to change this engine before we race tomorrow? So your dad had this habit of final practice, the last run – He'd pull up and get the Goodyear tire sheet. He'd get out of the car. 
the guys would push the car around to the fuel pumps and your dad would guide it. And then they'd push it to the garage area and your mm-hmm. dad would guide the car standing outside the car. So here comes the three car, no Dale. Where's Dale? I, I don't know. I don't know. So they're pushing it in there and I'm trying to get Danny's attention. Well, here comes J.R. Rhodes. And I said, J.R., where, where's Dale? Well, he's out there with some fans. It's like, he picked a hell of a time to mix and mingle with fans. I need to talk to that man. We've got a decision to make here about this engine. So finally, he comes by me, and he walked by me like I, I wasn't even standing there. And he's got something in his hand, and he's, he's on a mission. So he's, I see him over at the toolbox, and he's got something in his hand. He's got a tube of something in his hand, yellow glue, and he's trying to put yellow glue on a penny. And he's got it running down the arm of the sleeve of his Durham driver's <laughs> uniform. I said, what are you trying to do, Dale? He said, I got this penny, lucky penny. I'll put it on the dash of my car. I said, okay, if I help you put that penny on the <laughs> dash of the car, can we go over as a group and make a decision oh. on this engine? Well, after I got the whole story, I felt about that tall about being ill at him about he really wasn't mixing mingling with fans he was out there with a -a make-a-wish child wessa miller just still remember today her wish was to come to daytona and meet dale earnhardt and he was out there you know having some time with her and she gave him that penny and said that was her lucky penny she wanted him to have good news is we did change the engine the good news is we did win the race so did you find out why the I don't. Rocket. I don't know if I ever really got the reason. I just, uh, you know, and I think Spinny and Danny, they they would have been okay, right. but I think they were second guessing. You know, God forbid we leave that thing in there, as good as this race car is, and we that's why we have spare engines, and yeah. we feel like our spare and the backup to the spare is just as good as the primary. Let's put it in there and be done with it. Yeah, I remember that story about the uh, the girl, the Make-A-Wish kid, and gives him the penalty. You could lose the penny to the dash. It, he brought it up in Victory Lane. He it genuinely was felt. Part of the st- yeah, and he believed in that penny. He had enough glue on that penny to glue 100 pennies on the dash. <laughs> <though>. <laughs> it wasn't going anywhere. That is so neat, and, and it's so cool to hear that story because that it's such an uh, – there's no other way we would ever hear that. Uh, but but that was a prevalent part of his whole celebration was that penny. I remember as a fan, just when he won, that that was something that really stuck out was that the girl, um, she was handicapped. Yeah. The penny, he brought her into victory lane, and that was that was the story. And and uh, man, to hear you say that now, I'm curious where where were you guys going to start before you changed the engines? Well, we had, I think on the second row because we had won the dual race. Because you won the dual. Yeah, won the so, dual so race. So now you're in the back. Yep. And but, Well, back then, no, you didn't have to go to the rear oh, for changing engines. Yeah, we oh, is we that right? changed engines like we changed tires. They <laughs> did. So you could still start. All right. So, yeah. yeah you, so we didn't the, give up our start. So the decision to change the engines was much easier than I would have It was thought. just the fact of having an engine that had not turned a single lap that was the only little thing you're nervous about but i i was a lot less nervous about that engine than i was one that had had an issue on saturday even though it ran fine for those 20 or so laps on saturday Mm. what what about the race itself like what do you take away of before you even get to the end did things happen in the race that that stand out to you today it was it was almost as flawless as as the whole week was you know Pit stops were good. Car drove good. I, I don't know if we if we made any adjustments on that thing throughout the day, it, it was minimal. It may have been a little bit of air pressure. It may have been a little bit of wedge or a little bit of track bar here or there. It was it was just bare minimum. Uh, when I went to work at RCR, before we went to Daytona, Richard told me, he said, I just need to pre-warn you about something. As you know, Dale and Bill France Jr., are really tight and Bill French Jr. has a radio and every once in a while it's it's rare every once in a while he'll talk to Dale on the radio under caution (laughs) so the whole 97 season I never heard Bill French Jr. I guess there wasn't really a lot to talk to us about in 97 so (laughs) the last caution comes out I don't know 20 or so laps to go and I I call for two tires we come in leading we leave leading everybody else did two tires so it wasn't like we were rolling the dice or anything just felt like we didn't need to I felt like a lot of people was going to go with two and I didn't want to put him in the back with 15 or so laps to go 
So make the pit stop. We got the lead behind the pace car waiting on the one to go. And, and man, I was as uptight. If you'd have thumped me, I'd have probably crumbled. So all of a sudden, on the radio, I hear this voice that says, Hey, Sunday Money, this is Captain Jack. And I'm thinking, who the hell is Captain Jack? <laughs> <laughs> who is on our radio? And Richard saw me, and he knew I was about to have me a come apart. <laughs> Captain Jack is about to get cussed out, whoever yeah. Captain Jack is. And Richard about tackled me. And he kept pointing to – I went, oh, Captain Jack. And he just said, hey, Sunday Money, this is Captain Jack. Why don't you go snag that big one today? And of course, your dad knew who it was. He said, 10 4. We're going to do it. So, wow. That's I, pretty, that's I was a, about to, what? my NASCAR career was about to come to a close right there. <laughs> cussing the Captain world? Jack out. Cap- <laughs> so that was the name of the boats. Y- you know, I, I got well, it. I don't know I if anybody listening has got it. Yeah. <laughs> of course not. Especially the guy that's about to come I on totally around. forgot about Bill French Jr. and Captain Jack having the radio. <laughs> the president wow. of the sport going on, jumping on the radio. Man, and he's about to get cussed out if Richard hadn't stopped me. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh! Uh, who in that race had your most attention there in the last laps, as far as who y'all were racing against? Two Penske cars, you know, oh, Rusty yeah. and uh, Jeremy Mayfield. Uh, but I, I, I'm gonna tell you, unless something happened, the confidence I had in Dale Earnhardt when you put a car out on the racetrack. It, especially Daytona and Talladega, I knew unless something weird happened, which had happened many times, we as we know, that that it was ours to lose. That that there's that, just no question that that we were not going to get beat. You know, a lot of people look at me today and say, "You're my man. You're our guy. You got the man, the Daytona 500." And I stop them. I go, "Look, that's a flattering comment." I just happened to be the guy that was his crew chief when he didn't have a flat tire going off in the turn <laughs> three on the lap, yeah. didn't hit a right. seagull on the back straightaway, didn't blow an engine leading the race. I just happened to be the guy when it all finally came together and none of those things happened to that three car. You know, one of the things that always amazed me about is, it, you know, like I, on YouTube. Well, I just have to say, like, I, Go ahead. You're, I know you're humble, but there is a uh, – there, the feeling that people have, that feeling that you are the guy, you're the guy that delivered th- that um, that elusive win that was so important to Dad. Um, he did not want to end his career without something like that. <clears throat> um, that feeling is legit, like it's real. And um, I know that you, uh, he had some great cars, he had some great opportunities, there's some weird things that went on and reasons why he didn't win that race, but um you know that that feeling of that that you played a big role in helping him succeed uh and win that race i mean it's it's real and whether you, you can play it down all you want um and that's just you, who you are but well i i felt like the weight of the world yeah. that was lifted off I, my shoulders i wanted to ask you like that race the caution comes out Right, there was a wreck on the back straightaway. Mm-hmm. John Andretti and somebody mm-hmm. else spins down the back straightaway, and they throw the yellow. Um, so, instead of the traditional biting your nails to the very bitter end off a of turn four, coming to the checkered, who's going to get a run? Um, instead of that going, instead of living through that, you know, y'all were racing back to the yellow, cross the finish line. You know, the race isn't going to get restarted, right? Right. No overtime. Right. So nothing. you got, you have almost this un, an, um, uncharacteristic or unusual uh, lap to let it sink in, right? You're looking around and the, what are you doing? Are you, well, I, I still was not taking it for granted, Dale. You just you, you weren't going to do. I was thing. not going to to say this is done until I saw him truly come underneath that checkered flag, mm-hmm. and you know Danny Culler – our spotter, when the wreck happened over there coming off turn two on the back stretch, it was really not a bad wreck, no. but it was enough to bring the caution out. And Danny knew the deal. And I made sure and stayed off the radio, let Danny talk him back. You know, you got to bring – and, of course, I can remember Danny. You got to bring it back to the line, champ. You got to bring it back to the, to the line. And then the minute that happened, I said, you've got to make sure, maintain – 
caution lap speed, we got to get back around here one more time. I, I didn't want that to be the next freak, freak thing that happened sure. is we don't maintain caution lap speed and cars pass us or something freak happens. And so, yeah, until I saw that car – truly take that checkered flag mainly mainly i guess because of what we had been through in 97 and what i knew the three car had been through for 20 years trying to win this thing i wasn't going to count those chickens until that thing was absolutely underneath that checkered flag yeah what happened then (laughs) it's all a blur is it yeah honestly i mean i remember victory lane i i remember you know, going to the Unical suite with, with your dad and Richard and having a toast and going to Bill Jr.'s Captain Jack suite. <laughs> he gave us all a cigar. Going through the media car wash down on Pit Road, Richard and your dad and myself. And then the guys had taken the car and, and tore it apart for inspection, and then you have to put it back together. And honestly, I remember all those things, but – it didn't sink into me. It was pouring down rain when they finally loaded that thing back in that little trailer to, to be able to put it into to the Daytona experience the next morning. And none of my family was down there. They were all home sick with the flu. And I remember walking in the pouring down rain from the garage to my motor coach, and it was about 1130, quarter to 12. And when I sat down to take my shoes off, that's when I think it finally hit me. I went, damn. Just won the Daytona 500 with Dale Earnhardt. I don't think, even though I remember everything that went on, but there's one other one other moment, Dale and Mike, that I'll never forget as long as I live. It was in Victory Lane. I've told this story a lot. It was in Victory Lane, and things were kind of settling down a little bit, you know. But there's still pictures, pictures after pictures after pictures, and the crew was still there, and the car was still there. But I remember kind of taking a a step back. And in watching your dad and Teresa, and quite honestly, watching Richard and Judy. It's their first time, too. And I was fortunate enough six years prior to experience it with, with Davey, but it, it's still just as special. There's not – that it's. I'm sure if you win a third one, it's just as special, too. But to watch, especially your dad and Richard – it's almost like watching your kids unwrap their presents on yes. Christmas. That's what it meant to uh-huh. me to just take that step back and just kind of take it in and watch their smiles and their actions and how much it truly – I'll never forget that as long as I live. So you just watched that video, and I'm sure you enjoyed it. Well, you need to listen to the whole podcast. The Dale Jr. Download is available on all podcast platforms.